we'll see. Hey, I'm Shane McGalley. And I'm David Keener. I do. I'm Steve Moriarty. And this is the Arrowlings Podcast Project. Tonight we got a special guest, and Shay is driving the bus. Shay, take it away. All right, you guys. Yeah, I'm super excited uh, to welcome Steve onto our show. Um, Steve is an author, and he's also a lawyer, and Lord knows he's gotten me out of trouble many times. So this is a... Uh, I am paying, paying him back with this. So, Steve, we are so excited to have you, man. Um, we just want to talk about your book. Want to talk about your process. We all got some questions for you. So this is all about you tonight, man. You excited? I'm extravagantly excited. But well, thank you very much for having me in. Thank you. Oh, you attention whore. I know you. Um, so I'm going to start <laughs> off by asking just, you know, just an opening question. Just give us a little pitch. Like what, what is it that you write? Um, and what is your latest book? I've got one book out, Restitution. And it's, I guess, what would be called a legal mystery or legal thriller. Uh, and it's basically drawn on my roughly 40 years of uh, trying cases in courthouses all around Virginia. Very nice. Yeah, you, so let's talk about that because I'm very interested in the fact that you are a practicing lawyer. What was it like to bring your career into a, a fictionalized novel? Well, it, it's a, the, the longer answer is, I guess I've always liked the idea of trying to write a story. Uh, I, even before I even thought about going to law school, I played around with it. I took some courses in college, took creative writing. Uh, and in the late seventies, when I was in law school and I landed a job as an intern in the Commonwealth attorney's office, which is the prosecutor's office in Fairfax, uh, I saw so much stuff every day. Uh, I, and I thought there's just a wealth of information out here. Just this great stuff. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just plot lines. It wasn't just crazy things that happened in the cases. It was the people, uh, not just yeah. the defendants. Sometimes it was the witnesses, the victims, the detectives, the lawyers and the judges. It was just a wealth of information. And I remember thinking, I've got to write this stuff down every night. And there's, there's, there's good stories here. Now, it took many years for me to finally get the time to put it together. Uh, but a case I tried back in 1984 gave me the idea. And, and I got to thinking, I've got to be able to turn this into something uh, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the trial itself was, well, I won't worry about that. The trial itself was something that uh, uh, to me was surprising. One end or the other, it took three days to do it. Uh, and, uh, but afterwards, I, I got to thinking, you know, rather than trying to relate a nonfiction version of that, uh, let me play with it and, and develop characters around it and work it into more of an interesting story. Hmm. Uh, and uh, to somewhat paraphrase a professor I had back in college, he, he said that uh, he always believed that the people who like to write stories were those who like to really read good ones. Yeah. Thought, well, that's me. I like to read good ones. Uh, and uh, I got to think, well, I want to write a story that a guy like me would like to read. <laughs> and, uh, so Steve, and, uh, what, did, what actually inspired you to really get down to brass tacks and do it? Because a lot of people want to write a story. I yeah. mean, almost everybody I know does. But there is, it seems like there's some inspiration or catalyst or seminal event that gets people off the dime and, may, and gets them to write the story. Did you have any kind of thing like that happen for you? Uh. Sort of. Uh, I, I guess I'd had the inspiration to write. I always wanted to do it. I enjoyed writing. I'd done a short story now and then. It never really went any place. But about uh, eight years ago, uh, I, I came across a, a, just a um, like a, an advertisement solicitation uh, for a for a small class. Uh, it was available to eight people, uh, <laughs> and it turned out to be it was taught by someone who'd gone to college with me. I, I hadn't seen or heard from this person in forty years. Uh, she'd gone on to get a PhD in, in uh, creative writing and had been a tenured professor at uh, a, a college, I think, down in Texas. But had come back to Virginia, uh, where her, her family was, uh, and essentially she was doing something on the side where once every week she would host a 90-minute class by telephone. This is before Zoom existed. Uh, and I thought, let me take a look at this. And, and uh, what that did is it, it made me finally pull my notes, all the files of, of uh, scraps of people paper together, bring together a plot. Uh, and it got me started. And I remember thinking at the time, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. But I really enjoyed it. And and uh, I, that from there, I, I met someone who introduced me to this the same writing group that that uh, where Shay and I met uh, in Chantilly. And the program there is we meet every two weeks, and you would submit something for the for the rest of the group to uh, to read and hear. So it made me do at least one chapter every two weeks. Yep. And uh, I'd, I'd written most beforehand, but it gave me a chance to get it revised and, re and, and uh, re reviewed and, and uh, semi-edited uh, by these other writers. 
Uh, and so that took about, it was about a three-year process to write it. So really the, the genesis of it was uh, was this just this blind advertisement. It was just a mass thing that came through an alumni group. Hmm. And I just happened to recognize the person who was teaching it. And, and uh, But that, that made me do something I've been trying to do for a long time, probably for the previous 30 years. Every so often I'd sit down and try to write a chapter, write a scene, think, now I'm going to get going. But the process of trying to work full-time and raise four children, uh, hmm. I, I just... I kept thinking, well, not this week, but next week. <laughs> we go on for years. Uh, so it, it essentially got down to, it took me three years to write it, uh, three years to edit it and revise it. I got lucky. Uh, I, I found a uh, an agent who, having read it one night, uh, said, I think I can sell it. And within a month, she had a contract for it. That's awesome. Cool. Yes, good job. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely, obviously, I've read your writing, Steve, um, and you're just, you're an excellent writer as far as, like, just wonderful pace, it really moves, and you are great at breaking down a complex plot and making it digestible for the average Joe who does not know a lot of, you know, legal jargon and all that, and in fact, your courtroom scenes, I think, are just, they just really shine, and you get, you have that, that, that legal backing and you have some of the legal lingo but you're able to write it in a way that people like me can understand so i'm wondering like what has been the reaction uh, that you've seen from readers who are not lawyers who are not familiar with courtroom drama but who just love it well it's it's it's, uh, it's funny you would ask that yeah <laughs> that's really what i was aiming for uh as you might imagine uh for somebody with my background and i don't mean to try to sound like clarence darrow uh oh. but having been around courthouses and tried cases for quite a while. When I watch a television show or a movie where somebody who obviously has no idea what the courtroom procedures are like, what the rules of evidence are, and they string together a, a, a TV show or some kind of a story, yeah. it, it makes my skin crawl. <laughs> what I try to do is write it that was realistic, but not overly pedantic, not so deep into the detail that, uh, that somebody who, who isn't in, involved in trial work would be baffled by it. So I try to write it so that the person's who, who are trial lawyers understand why there are certain rules and what they mean and, and why certain things have to happen in courtrooms. But also somebody who's a lawyer would say, yeah, that's right. That's the way it's supposed to go. I got two uh, contacts after the book was out. One was from a retired judge up in Baltimore who said, finally, somebody writes a book about how it really works. <laughs> uh, and, and I got others from people who said, now I understand. You know, folks who didn't understand, yeah. they, they hear objections for hearsay or, or, your foundation or whatever. They don't really quite understand what that means. And try to put it out there so you understand why lawyers do what they do when they're trying to put on a case. Uh, hmm. Again, not, not so much to make a seminar out of it, but to sort of yeah. say, this, this, is, this is the reason these things happen. And that made the rest of it sort of flow. And also, I think it, it made the courtroom scenes more realistic because what I would try to do to write these things, uh, you know, I, again, I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to sound like a professional writer because I've got one book under my belt. But what I try to uh, write these things. I sit myself in a room, the doors closed, I'm at a table with nothing on it but a blank piece of paper and a pencil and a cup of coffee. That's it. No radio, no music, no distractions. Hmm. I try to sink into what the scene must feel like, whether it's in a car driving along or in the courtroom, in a hallway, whatever it is. What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What's the temperature like? Uh, and from that, it just sort of flows. Yeah, I mean... Well, your writing process starts with uh, pen and paper? I do everything longhand. Uh, wow. Now, now what then right. what I do is what my and I, I I type pretty well, but I found that that if I'm trying to compose a story on the computer, it looks too good al already. You know that nice crisp, you know, blank uh, screen with uh, with a nice font. It looks better than it really is. Uh, so <laughs> so so my my first revision is when I'm typing it. That's the first round of edits. Hmm. I'll, I'll I'll say I'm almost embarrassed to say it about restitution. It was twelve drafts. Uh, hmm. but, but, and that's counting every time I went back and revised it because I wanted everything, every word, every paragraph to have a meaning. It wasn't just to sort of flow and say, then this happened, then that happened. Everything had to have a reason. Uh, but no, I, I start off with longhand. Uh, and it seems to me, it's, for me, it's got to be that way. Uh, and I believe if you saw the notes, there's all sorts of lines and cross outs and it's, it's, it's a mess, but it, yeah. but it gets me where I, I have I've to go. I've seen your handwriting, Steve, and it's like, <laughs> you need a magnifying glass, you know, to make out uh, the vowels. So I, I don't know how you do it, man. <laughs> so how polished is it on the uh, the first longhand draft? Not very, not very. <laughs> now, now sometimes I'll, I'll even like leave blank lines because I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say, what I'm going to call something. Uh, but I try to get the story down right. Uh, but then when I, the first time I sit down to type it, that's when I start filling things in, and I and I, and I, I don't try to write the final version 
uh, either the first or the second draft. Uh, and part of this goes back, this may sound like an odd uh, comparison, uh, but when I was in, in college, I took some art classes. And long before that, I was sort of an amateur artist. And I found that when you try to draw a picture, if the first thing you're doing is draw, drawing with bold lines, trying to make the final product too soon, it comes out all out of proportion. It's a mess. You got to start off with this very light, scratchy little lines and eventually turn it into the final product. Hmm. So how many pages uh, is your handwritten story? Um, in your first draft, how many pages does that turn out? Oh gosh, it was probably three hundred. Because I outline in longhand in the beginning, and my outlines are only about thirty-five pages, but um, they're just outlines. Me, you never yeah. told me you did that in longhand. Yeah, yeah. the very first uh, outline I, I, that I do is longhand. I, I do find that that interesting that uh, you do your first draft in um, um, in, in longhand. Uh, I've heard people refer to a process like that as starting with a zero with draft, right? Where you where you sort of just try to get the raw structure of your story down, um, and then you worry about the, all the you know polishing and filling in later on and stuff. I've just never heard of anybody doing it with like longhand before. I've got a kind of a different way of obviously doing it. Uh, I don't really have a very well structured outline. Uh, what I have is an idea of what I want to have happen, and I have a little document that I, I titled things that have to happen uh, and it'll be a list. And, and I'll, I'll, as I'm trying to build a story just in my own head before I start writing it, all the various things that have to happen to get from the very beginning to the very end, with, with what's going to fill in between it. Uh, and then I start sorting out what order they're going to be. Uh, so as, a, as I'm going through, I'm kind of checking off, have these things happened yet? Uh, so sometimes... congratulations, you've written the beat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's it's the, the story beats that you have to hit in order to get to your conclusion. It's not quite an outline, but it's a it's a series of beats for your story. So it's interesting uh -huh. again to me that you've worked into like everybody has a different process. It's it's your your process is very interesting to me though. So restitution came out almost a year ago, right? Um, May twenty twenty two, and uh, tell us a little more about how you found your publisher. I know you said you have an agent, but how did you guys land on this specific publisher and, and why? I have no idea how she found him. <laughs> <laughs> magic. And, There's some magic. And, yes. <laughs> and I didn't ask any questions. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a, a good friend of mine who actually turned out he and I were, were college classmates, although we never met in college. We knew a lot of people in common. And we had a trial against each other probably 30 years ago. And even though we were uh, adversaries, we got along well enough. Huh. At one point, we had, we had lunch afterwards, and he mentioned something at, about uh, a class he'd take. He and I had, had the same writing professor, but at different times. Uh, and he, at that point, had, had, had written a novel, which uh, he was working on, never got published. But years later, after about several tries, he had actually gotten several books published. And he, and he put me in contact with his, his agent. As I said, I, I sent her my manuscript on a Sunday night when I came in Monday morning uh, to look at my email. She'd read it and said she thought she could sell it. Wow. Uh, and she found uh, a, a publisher uh, out in uh, New Mexico uh, with an office in, in New York. Uh, and they were very cooperative about it. And uh, uh, despite all the, the, the difficulties of, of COVID, uh, they got it out uh, uh, last uh, spring. I guess, I think it actually got released in May. I think it really hit uh, Amazon sometime in the summer and sales started picking up by then. What's the name of the publisher again? Oh, gosh. Uh, speaking, speaking Volumes. Like, speaking I Volumes. It is. Yeah, I, I love your, you, they did a great job on your cover. Um, I really like the cover. Yeah, it definitely I, I, says legal thriller. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, I, I, uh, I had nothing to say about that except yeah. I asked to change the font a little bit, uh, but that was it. Uh, they, they, I, I wanted to shrink my name and have the, the, the name of the book a little bit bigger. <laughs> that was about all I could figure to it. Uh, was, a rare really moment of humility, right? A rare moment. <laughs> yeah. no, that so, was great. Steve, if, the, if your first book uh, took you six years to get, get it out, you've had a year since this one. You start working on the next project yet? I am. I'd, I'd like to be farther along in it. Uh, it, it. It's another story with with Bill Duncan as the uh, the uh, protagonist, uh, and it's a. Uh, it's. I, I wish it was further along than it is. But the story is pretty well mapped out. Uh, the actual writing is about a quarter to a third of the way done, and I hope to have that to the publisher later this year. That's awesome. So you're Where's working you? on a faster pace now, too. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it won't be thirty years in the making. I'll tell you. I, I don't think I live long enough to finish a trilogy if that what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your promo plan? Are you doing a book launch, book signing? Or it's kind of been kind of hard with COVID, but one of the difficulties I found is that uh, uh, because speaking volumes only operates through uh, uh, 
uh, online purchases. The second is one of the, I guess you probably run into what they call it, the print on demand. Uh, right. So if tomorrow morning you want to buy the book, that book doesn't exist yet, but you order it by that afternoon, it's on its way to you and it's been put together. So it's not, uh, it's not placed in stores. Uh, but then again, I think most people these days are buying their books online anyway. Uh, I think yeah. there are eight different sources. The primary ones are uh, Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what I found is the bookstores who find that I am, am uh, published and distributed by Amazon don't want to cooperate. They hmm. really don't want to have a book signing. Interesting. Uh, they, they see that as competition. My right. my, my thus far, uh, maybe much my legal skills uh, uh, not doing as well as I thought they should have, uh, but my uh, argument to them has been Amazon's not going away. Uh, it, let, let me come in, and if people like my book, they'll buy that, but they'll be in your store, uh, yeah. and maybe they'll see something they like when they're there. Uh, hmm. Thus far, that has not uh, been as successful as I'd like. I, I did one book signing. It was uh, at a local library, but uh, it was not at a, at, a, at a store. Well, you got a whole trilogy to figure this out, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Well, Dave, so right? Indie bookstores might be a little bit more um, uh, helpful in that regard. Well, that's, that's probably what I should uh, look more into doing is, is uh, trying to find some of the locals like that. Just, just for the same reasons that I suggested that get the warm bodies in there, they'll buy something else. Uh, for me, whenever I go to a bookstore, I'm like a heroin addict in, a, in a, an opium den. I, I go in to look for one book and I come out with 10. Sorry. Dave, don't you have a traditional question that you always ask all our guests? Something about bad advice? <laughs> Or the worst <laughs> advice, right? What's the worst worst writing advice you've ever gotten? <laughs> Don't do it. It's a waste of time. You'll never sell anything. <laughs> but but to be honest, uh, I mean, I'd love it if I sold a million copies and Hollywood was beating down my door to turn into a movie. But I would have written it no matter what. Uh, I, I, I found that uh, uh, I, I, des I described my preferred scenario where I'm just locked away in a, in a, in a closed door room uh, writing. Even if I do it for several hours and I'm, I'm really tired, uh, maybe even drained at the end of it, I feel energized. I, I really enjoy it. it it's a, the, the creative process is something that is just hard to describe. Uh, it, it's really uh, uh, an enjoyable thing. And frankly, if nobody but my, uh, my, my family and close friends ever read the book, uh, uh, I might be a little bit disappointed, but I'd be, I'd be fine with that. Uh, yeah, I think all of us can, I, can identify with that. There's, there's something gratified about gratifying about coming up with something on your own and here it is and you know i'm like you i prefer that the whole world you know see it but uh, i'd still be doing it anyway amen yep, me too are we right so why we do this podcast we just like it we like each other we like being here so you know. <laughs> we've uh, been doing this podcast for a few years now and yeah. uh, you know Going strong it's fun it you know <laughs> this we're about 120 out. episodes in actually what's that we're about 120 episodes in now. Yeah, 127, wow. I think. Yeah. I'm not the only one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're not the only one we've tortured. There have been others before you and every other's after you. Uh, Marty, Dave, any other last questions for Steve? Steve, do you, have you ever had writer's block? <laughs> uh, I, 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 the, the short answer, I guess, has to be yes, but it's not so much that I didn't know what to write. It was... I knew I wanted to get to the next place. And, and the question is, how do I get there? How to make those transition type chapters? Uh, so I've always had plenty of stuff left to go uh, and, and, and to say. Uh, I just didn't uh, sometimes know the best way to, to, to move from where, I, where, the, where the characters were to, to get to that spot. So right. it kind of related to that. What I, I, I've come to, this, to learn that every author has different challenges that they have to uh, battle against. Um, uh, have you found that there's any specific challenges when it comes to writing besides a full-time job? Uh, uh, some people, it's small children, small, you know, some people, you know, they don't have the privacy to do it. Some people, you know, uh, can't write in their own house. They have to go to a coffee shop. You have any challenges like that? <laughs> Almost all of them. <laughs> well, it really, it's just the time. Uh, I, I found that I can I can take notes and sketch out ideas anywhere. At a traffic light, uh, sometimes sitting in a courtroom waiting for my case to get called. I'll I'll tuck away and, and scratch away some notes, and I'll 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 keep a separate uh, file folder for those sorts of things. When it comes down to the time to actually sit down and start creating it, 
uh, that's where uh, it's hard to do that in a 10 or 15 minute snatch. I have to have that, that time. And there, there's quite frequently uh, times I'll look ahead. I know the, the good writers all say, you got to do it every day. I wish I could do it every day. What I'm trying to do is I'll segregate a few hours on one day of the week. I say, that's what I'm going to do it. I got my stuff ready to go. And all of a sudden something else drops in the middle of it. And those hours, which have been carefully segregated by me, get blown up by somebody else. Yep. Uh, so with hard, all the lessons yeah. that you've learned, getting the process of your book published to uh, the universe, what piece of advice would you give a budding new author that's trying to um, write their first novel? That's a, that's a good question. I, I guess uh, I think one one uh, trap writers can fall into, they think that because they're interested, everybody's interested. Mm. But try to be honest with what you're writing. Is anybody else going to be interested in reading this? Uh, it's, it's probably more applicable to autobiographical stuff. Uh, but although mm. was, was the author, uh, 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 I'm forgetting his name right now, who said that uh, all fiction was autobiographical anyway. Oh, right, right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you, you wanted to... Uh, you, you want it to be something that, that appealed to someone else to make them want to turn the page. Uh, and when, when, what I try to do, which I, I guess I would convey on to other writers is when you're writing a chapter, when somebody finishes that chapter, you want to make going on to the next one irresistible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, any last comments to our, uh, our, our many millions of fans out there listening? <laughs> Jump on Amazon, buy that book. It's the best one you'll ever read. <laughs> yes, by by restitution. Um, Steve, I love you. Thank you for coming on. And I trust that my balance at your law firm is now taken care of, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're even. We're, we're good. We're even. Good. All right, guys. See you next time. All right. Thanks for coming, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Good on you. Thanks.